Lights. Camera. Rolling. Action. He's looking at you, kid. Say hello to my little friend! Hi, this is Joe, and this is the Film Joe Podcast, where film talk happens. One, two, Hi, I'm Joe, and I'm here with Daisy. Hello. And welcome to the Film Joe Podcast, where we talk about films, filmmakers, trends, the good, the bad, and the not so bad, all in the spirit and for the love of film. Uh, So this week, we are comparing one of my all-time favorites from 1980, John Carpenter's The Fog, with the remake that came out in 2005. So this is going to be interesting. Um. (laughs) You know, I think this is one of your favorites as well. Um, you know what though, I I can't really say that it's one of my favorites, uh, especially since I saw it so late in in, in I don't know my uh, movie watching career, I guess you can call it. <laughs> right. <laughs> um. Yeah, I I never seen this movie until like you know some years ago, and yeah, it, it's freaking awesome. It's I I think it's really a, a unique horror me- movie. I, I yeah. totally dug it. Oh yeah, definitely, definitely. So I look forward to talking about this one. Um, now, for everybody, please keep in mind. Uh, remember, we're not professional film critics here, so don't call us out and say, "Oh, you guys don't." We're just film lovers who love to talk about films, right? Exactly, exactly. Right. So now, based on the film where we are uh, discussing uh, on this episode, uh, we're going to go on the Film Joe scale of one to ten, fish hooks. Ooh. Okay. All right. Not too bad. Not too bad. Uh, Right, hey, there you I, go. I would have gone with barnacles, but yeah, you know. Bar- barnacles is kind of good too. Hmm. Barnacles. But then again, it does kind of give me a SpongeBob vibe. So, well, we'll go with fish hooks. Okay, yeah, yeah, because this is far from uh, SpongeBob. Nothing. Close. Barnacles. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, by the way, you mentioned that uh, you you're getting your pool uh, 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 cleaned up and everything ready for the spring and summer. Oh my God. Yes. After like a really cold ass winter out here, I just recently moved to, um, to Afton, New York. And, uh, so, you know, now it's starting to get really nice and warm. We're getting the pool ready and I, I can't wait, you know, the, and the summer out here is just so promising. I, you know, so much to look forward to. I, I just came back from a really cool fair out here, uh, at, uh, where's it in Bainbridge uh-huh. and, Oh my God. It was beautiful. Wow. So you get that whole small town uh, feel. Definitely. Yes. Um, it, it's totally different from, from the city life, to be honest. Um, Bainbridge is a, it's a, it's a little neighboring town to Afton. And, um, you know, every year they, they have um, a fair and they have like this really cool canoe race that goes from one, you know, part of town to the other. Uh, they have um, hot air balloons, uh, you know, and then the food, they have all the, you know, you know, corn dogs, uh, funnel cakes and oh. with, without the crowds. Wow. Of your, you know, I, I, I don't know if you've ever been to the Orange County Fair. Yeah, yeah. It's awesome. I love it. But this one, oh, my God, it's, it's no crowds. Uh, just, you know, just. You know, but my, my daughter, she was there with us and, you know, she actually bumped into a couple of her schoolmates and, wow. you know, everybody knows everybody. Wow. That is so cool. I'm so jealous. I mean, the closest I got to a river over here or a stream is the fucking LA river that runs under the bridge of the, uh, the, the 22 freeway out here. Exactly. Yes. I mean, you know, and then the drive over there, it's just so beautiful and green, Wow. no traffic, you know, no road rage. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. No traffic? Is that a thing? I mean, no freaking traffic. I've, you know, I'm going to start. Yeah. It, no freaking traffic jams. Um, yeah. You know, you get in your car, you get there. That's it. No stress. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Well, I can wait. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm headed out there, uh, April of next year for your birthday. So I'm really looking forward. Wait. Oh yeah. my God. I cannot wait to show you around. We have the, uh, the baseball hall of fame out here. Oh, uh, Yes. Oh my God. Yeah. I've never been happier. And wow. you know, yeah, it's awesome. 
Wow, I can't wait. It, it sounds really, really beautiful. I mean, again, I just get super jealous. I mean, I like Orange County. I've been out here for about, uh, what, 12 years or so. And it, it, it's, it's a big difference from uh, L.A. Uh, Orange County is about 30, 40 miles uh, southeast of L.A. And it's a different vibe out here, but nothing like the Mayberry town that you guys got. That sounds really awesome. Oh my God. Yeah, it is amazing. And you know, it's not the city of Afton. No, it's the village of Afton. Oh, excuse me. Whoa. The village of Afton. <laughs> yes. I mean, yeah, we, we have our own little tiny little, little market. We have a little post office, wow. uh, our little library. I mean, it's beautiful. I, you know, you go outside and you hear all the different types of birds and, you know, little, uh, squirrels running by. Oh yeah, you know, we, we 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 got squirrels. Out. Oh no, fuck it, they're rats. Never mind. <laughs> no, you guys have you know you do see squirrels sometimes in the backyard. Not like here. You you know I see in a freaking what is that a, a groundhog hanging oh. out near my pool the other day. Wow, that is cool. Yeah, we is call, cool. he he's our little fat bastard. He's awesome. That yeah. I mean that's just amazing. I I like again. I just can't wait to uh, go out there next year. So once uh, you visit, you will you're you're gonna want to stay. Oh. Well, I, I do plan to retire out there someday, so be cool. Yes, definitely. We can, you know, grow old, you know, out here together, drinking our lemonade and iced teas and our and, porch. And record the podcast. That's right, because the Film Joe podcast will still be going. Absolutely, absolutely. Now, talk about film. They, have you seen the new trailer for Beverly Hills Cop, Axel Foley? Oh, my God. Yes, yes. I I'm like... Yeah, it was. It looks so freaking awesome. I love that they, you know, we saw the familiar faces, um, including that the actor that that was in Perfect Strangers. I want to oh, say he was there. Yeah, Bronson Pinchot. He's back, dude. Yes, I, I'm like so freaking stoked. Yeah, I mean, uh, it definitely feels like a Beverly Hills Cop film um, now because there was three or there's three already that were made. Yeah, so this is the fourth one. This is the fourth. And for those of you who haven't seen him or haven't seen him for a while, do a rewatch, uh, except part three. Part three was hard to watch. Oh, um, was it? I don't think I've ever seen part three. Yeah. And what's interesting about, about part three is that it's directed by John Landis. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah. And John Landis directed Eddie Murphy in Trading Places and in Coming to America. Okay. But totally but, different feels, though. Yeah. Yeah. So part three was pretty bad, but uh the the trailer for the new film looks just amazing it is eddie murphy at his best and and that man does not freaking age what kind of freaking water is he drinking oh tell me about it i mean you have uh billy you know, the character billy i forgot his name uh he looks haggard and old i mean well he is but oh. eddie murphy he only he looked like he only aged like about four years seriously you know a little bit chubbier but i mean he looks flawless yeah amazing so i can't wait and uh also the uh at the time of this recording we just got the new trailer for beetlejuice beetlejuice yes uh oh my god i i don't know what to say i was speechless when i saw because they released a, a teaser trailer uh i think it was last month yeah yeah they gave and, us more a whole lot more this time and oh my god i can't wait yeah, you know what? This summer and this year, this is the it's for the old schoolers, the the OGs who knew how to make uh, great Hollywood movies. Yeah, no, definitely this summer has great potential for for movies. This year, yeah. period. Yeah, absolutely, and, and you know, there's hardly any uh, Marvel superhero stuff out there. So don't don't get us wrong. We love ourselves some Marvel, but it just it was. Um, it was just too much you know it's like when you eat too much candy it just you know gives you a toothache you can't no more yeah i fucking wanted to throw up i ate so much candy it was ridiculous at one yeah. point i mean it was it's it was it was a great run but you know it's it's time to give you know let other movies shine yeah and i think that's uh, we're slowly kind of getting back to the era of uh more uh diverse type of films yeah definitely yeah so so now let's uh let's segue here i did well there was no segue, but uh, <laughs> we, we got this segment that uh, we, we like to call, if I could remake one film, and, and all right, and what we do here is that we each pick a film, we get a cast, uh, a director, uh, describe the plot, general plot, uh, plot of the film, and why we want to remake it, all right? 
Okay, yes. I'm, I can't wait. All right, let's do this. So you go first. I will go first. Okay. So oh, I didn't even write down what year this was made. Uh, maybe you can help me with that. Because okay. uh, I know you've seen the movie. If I could remake a movie, I would remake The Last Starfighter. Holy shit. That, that, <laughs> oh, that's about 84, 83, I'd have to say, roughly. Yeah, so basically it's about this kid lives in a little small town in a, in a what is that, in a trailer park. You know, not much of a future, you know, kind of dismal. His only highlight is a video game machine that's, you know, that's in the park. And, you know, he loves to play that thing. And so one day he goes there. And yeah, the, the game is called The Last Starfighter, I want to say. Right, and it he, is, actually. Yeah, so he beats the, 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 he beats somebody's score. He breaks somebody's score. Then all of a sudden he is recruited into, you know, their their um like a space academy for there you go. yeah like a space academy mm -hmm. and so yeah so they pick him up and they start training him and it's a it's an awesome movie it's really a freaking awesome movie uh a, a movie that literally has been forgotten in time it has it definitely has so i think you know now is the time you know that they should do this i think it would be awesome so for my cast i only picked two uh two you know okay to cast um so for the character of alex rogan which is the the high school uh kid i would go with tom holland oh fuck that is perfect yeah oh yeah he's he's a perfect combination of geeky cute and a little badass i can definitely see that yes and then um to play you know his girlfriend um i would pick um ella fanny Okay. All right. Yeah, th that's up for debate. I'm, I'm not really, you know, well versed with the, you know, the young generations, you know, little actresses and actors. Right. But I thought she was cute, so you know, I went with Ella Fanning. Okay. Um, okay. Okay. And and if I had to pick somebody to direct this, I would either go with or maybe both. Hey, maybe they can collab. Okay. J.J. Abrams and Sp uh, Steven Spielberg. Oh. Two of my favorites. You know, I can see this. I can definitely. Yeah. I, you know what? It's one of those films that it had a great story, great characters. Um, and uh, it was very memorable. Unfortunately, the the FX. Well, yeah, ex exactly. And you're, now we're at a perfect time for that. Yeah. In fact, I believe it was they did do some computer generated imagery, uh, but it was in its infancy, uh, the very beginning. And it looks bad now, but. To me, it doesn't take away from the charm and the sweetness of the film. Exactly. And like I said, not a lot of people know about this movie. So, okay. yeah, I, I would love to see it remade. Okay. I I, I can't argue with that one. I mean, because usually this, some, no, you don't touch that. But that one, that's, that's ripe uh, for a remake. Yeah, definitely. All right. So, here I go. Ready for this one? All right. I'm ready. If I could remake one film, it would be Lady Hawk. From 1985. Yes. Okay. Now, okay. 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 Now, bear with me here. All right. I'm uh, buried because that's one of my favorite movies. Yes. Mine as well. And uh, the, the film is basically about uh, some hustler thief, young kid. His name is Gaston, uh, who escapes uh, the, a dungeon from a medieval uh, castle or something. And he crosses through the latrines and he escapes. Soldiers are about to kill him. You know, because they're trying to get him when he's saved by the rogue Navare, mm. this rogue warrior. And so Navare, he joins him on his travels and uh, Navare has a hawk that accompanies him. And what it is, is that the hawk is actually his lover who has been turned into a hawk by, by a curse by, I think it was some prince or some king. It was a bishop. A bishop who was in love with her. Mm -hmm. So... By day, he is human, and she's a hawk. And by night, he's a wolf, and she's human. And they only get to see each other for a fraction of a second as the sun rises, which is beautiful. Painfully beautiful. Oh, yeah. So it's a great film, okay? Now, why would I remake it? I mean, yeah, you know, first of all, the story's perfect. It's beautiful. It's fantasy, adventure, comedy, romance. But first of all, the score. Didn't like the score. Okay, yeah, I, I agree with you with, on that. I think they could have done better. Yeah, it's a synth score versus uh, an orchestral score, which f was very common back then. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, so, you know, uh, and that kind of took the tone off of the film. 
uh, should be more fantasy driven and so forth. And of course, these special effects in some in, in some of the scenes are kind of cringy. A little bit, yeah. Yeah. So, but aside from that, it's a great film. But it could I can definitely see a remake for this. Okay. All right. I I think I'd watch it, but I mean, they gotta do it just right. You all gotta right, well, cast it just right. So let's okay. hear it. All right. So for the role of Gaston, which was Matthew Broderick in the original. Okay. I'm going with timothy chalamet okay all right he, he was recently in uh wonka and in dune part one and two okay okay he's young enough looking for the role uh and he's very versatile he can do comedy and goofiness but also be very serious which i think kind of would work perfectly for the role of gaston okay okay Isabeau. all right the hawk the lady hawk Okay, was, just, we're, we're dealing with you know michelle pfeiffer here who is gorgeous yeah. and ugh. how can you top michelle pfeiffer well, exactly you, well you can come close with scarlett johansson oh you got me there that's yeah. uh, you know if, if i liked girls that that she'd be she's my girl crush there you go. I, she would be perfect i mean she has the acting oh. chops she has the looks she's beautiful you can you can definitely see her in a romantic fantasy film Okay, yeah, you got me there. You got me there. All right. Now, Navare, which is the rogue warrior, the lover of Isabeau, right? Who's okay. cursed in his love for, for, okay. All right, all right. Who, who was played by Rutger Hauer, who was a badass back in the day. He was badass. He was definitely badass. I would cast Kit Harrington from Game of Thrones. Ooh, okay. Uh, 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 uh. I mean, look, a scene oh, with God. Kit Harrington and Scarlett Johansson held in a passionate uh, embrace, it would melt the fucking screen. Oh, dude, that would be that would be nice. That would be beautiful. Now, the director, the original film was directed by the late great Richard Donner, who directed such great films as Superman, uh, The Omen, The okay. Goonies. Uh, all the Lethal Weapon films, a legend, a legendary director. Definitely. I would choose a director by the name of Gareth Edwards. What did he direct? He did Star Wars, Rogue One, mm -hmm. Monsters. He recently did a film called The Creator. He did Godzilla. Okay, all right. I think he could do it. Yeah, he has a great background in special effects, and he is in, a very intuitive director, and he can definitely pull this off. Ooh, yeah, because that, that's that's the thing that I have, you know, an issue with with uh, remakes is especially as one is beloved to me as Lady Hawk, I would want them to please do it right. You know, just all it needs is a polishing. It doesn't need to be rewritten. Just a nice polish of the of the movie. You know. Yeah, absolutely, and that's you know because it, it's 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 near perfect as it is but like you said a polishing and with a director like uh gareth edwards um rogue one which to me was the best of the new star wars films oh yeah uh, definitely they were very focused on the characters and the developments of of, of of you know the background and so forth he he knows how to to work uh the personalized elements of, of a plot for characters so i think he would be perfect for it absolutely oh wow yeah that would be cool i would yeah i'd be in the theater right there hey. watching this yeah there you go see okay. i knew i knew you were going to initially be like ah uh, no or oh, no 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 <laughs> but with a cast like that and a director like that you can't freaking lose yeah scarlet joe definitely could put it off kit harrington he's a cutie patootie who knows how to wield a sword or at oh. least you know he's a good enough actor to you know portray that yeah, you know absolutely. yeah absolutely. Yeah, perfect. All righty. So there, there's our two uh, remakes. Hollywood, if you're listening, take note, please. Mm -hmm. And do it right. And do it right. Absolutely. <laughs> All right. So now, as for remakes, what do you say we can into uh, this week's episode? All right, let's do it. For our first film, At the Stroke of Midnight, Six Must Die. 11.55, almost midnight. Enough time for one more story. Five minutes, it'll be the 21st of April. 
it is told by the fishermen and their fathers and grandfathers that when the fog returns to Antonio Bay, the men at the bottom of the sea rise up. An unearthly fog rolls into a small coastal town exactly a hundred years after a ship mysteriously sank in its waters. The film we are talking about here is The Fog from 1980 and is directed by John Carpenter. The film stars Adrian Barbeau, Jamie Lee Curtis, and Hal Holbrook. Now, I don't know about you, but to me, this is my, it has to be one of my top favorite John Carpenter films he ever made. It was awesome. I mean, you know, it was very unique. I mean, Oh, it's, it's, it's amazing. You know, what I love about it, it's, 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 it's a genuine ghost story. Yeah. You know, you, you know, what I love about it too, is that you can almost smell the seawater, you know, you could, you could, you almost feel like you're there, you know, the clammy coldness of the fog. It, it was awesome. Oh, it's very atmospheric and, and, and very, it, 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 it it's, it, you get immersed into, into the storyline. I mean, and you know, the trick behind it is John Carpenter's, amazing directorial skills uh the pulse of his of his score which he wrote the music for his film. that music that that score it was it was amazing oh, oh do yeah. i mean it gives you that that sense of urgency and anxiety one thing they did because carpenter was definitely going for a ghost story approach you know something that you tell uh around a campfire uh which is well, how it opens too it, Exactly, with John uh, John Houseman telling the story, and um, that scene was not in the original cut. Oh, really? Yeah, and and so upon watching the the rough cut of the film, once they finished uh, the principal photography, they realized we need to have somebody telling the story, and then it kind of developed into a campfire with kids uh, at midnight. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And and what more perfect way to start? You know, the, the the story, because what John Carpenter does right there is he grabs you by the hand. And he goes, come with me. I'm going to tell you a story. Yes, exactly. Exactly. And, and it worked. It, it, it was great. Um, By the way, did you just catch John Carpenter's cameo in this? No, I didn't. Oh, man, it's it's so cool. Okay. Remember when the, the priest uh, played by Hal Holbrook, one mm -hmm. another one of my favorite character actors. Right. Uh, he um when he's in the rectory and he's looking at the notes and the book and all that i guess the journal um his assistant comes in he, he turns off all the lights in fact this is during i believe when the credits are rolling and one uh, towards the beginning uh -huh. and his assistant is going through the church turning off the lights turning off candles that's john carpenter no you know what? I, I wondered what happened to that character i'm like oh he gonna get dead yeah, exactly. No, he's like, no, uh, you guys continue. I got to go direct this film. <laughs> Dude. Yeah, he's like, um, can I get paid? <laughs> <laughs> but that, that was pretty neat. I mean, it's funny because he does seem kind of out of place. For those of you who don't know John Carpenter, he's a great director of films like Halloween, Escape from New York, Assault on Precinct 13, and so many other memorable films. Uh, he makes a cameo on this, and the way he, he's he was a hippie looking kind of dude. Uh, he had a long mustache, long hair, uh, mm -hmm. bell bottom pants. And so here we got this coastal town and it's very, and here comes this hippie walking through the, I'm like, Whoa, he seems kind of out of place. Severely. I had no idea. Yeah. Yeah. Again, let's do a recap on the plot for those. Who, it's a, uh, it's a little sleepy town in uh, Antonio Bay. Mm -hmm. It's the name of the town, and it's an old town, it's over a hundred years old, and they're going to celebrate the hundred year that like, is the centennial. Mm -hmm. uh, and, yeah, of the birth uh, of the town. Yeah, exactly. And uh, and then a mysterious fog starts to roll in, and what it is is that uh, there was a sh uh, a ship full of lepers uh, that wanted they wanted to buy some land nearby so that they can have a leper colony. And so they made an arrangement with the original founders of Antonio Bay. We'll pay you all this stuff in gold and you let us have that land. Cool, right? <laughs> well, well, the fuckers down in Antonio Bay, they're like, okay, cool. They took their gold and like, burn the fucking ship. 
Yeah. And they, yeah, and they sink the ship and all the lepers die. So on the hundredth anniversary, they're coming back. These, you know, these dead pirate looking things and uh, they come into the fog all to reclaim their gold and and the six that must die are the are descendants of the original six conspirators. Uh-huh. Just great storytelling. And again, uh there's you, you think, oh, it's a fog rolling in. How fucking scary can that be? How much how can you build suspense? Well, pfft, he, it's amazing the way he does it with the music is a pounding sound score that he pushes in and he kind of corners you. Well, yeah, definitely. And you don't get to see much of the, you know, of those, you know, of the the pirates or anything. But, you know, you take away one of your senses, you know, like sight, you, you can't see anything with this fog, but you know there's something in there that is hunting you. And that's what makes it more terrifying. Yes. Um. So it, 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 it's just a master class in suspense storytelling. Another trick that John Carpenter does, I mean, his, we'll get to the budgets and money later. But it was a, obviously a fairly, very uh, low budget film. But if you look at it, it's filmed in uh, Panavision, widescreen, uh, and it's just beautifully lit. And you do, it looks like an expensive film. But that, that's just being smart. Yeah, he knew how to work camera. He did the same for uh, Escape from New York. Uh, he used the best film, really great uh, uh, camera work, good, you know, Panavision cameras. And it gives the look of a, a very polished, uh, high budget film. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know and then top that off with you know a great cast oh uh, you, you got uh what two actors that came from uh that were in uh creep show adrian barbeau uh -huh. and, and hal holbrook oh love those two and then you got two more from the halloween movies uh you have uh jamie lee curtis uh -huh. and, and uh i forgot her, her name but nancy, her last name. Loomis. nancy loomis who was in the original halloween that's right and then the original Scream Queen, Janet Lee. Janet Lee, which is Jamie Lee Curtis's mama. And what movie was she in? Oh, Psycho. And you know what's great is that these little cameos back and forth, they didn't seem forced or they didn't seem gimmicky. They just, Not at all. They, they fit perfectly together. Oh, uh, it, it was great. An well, another character, another actor we forget forgot to mention. Oh, he also creep show. What was his name? Something Atkins. Uh, yeah, I know he was the dad that smacks the crap out of his kid in in uh, in, <laughs> in creep show. Tom Atkins. Yeah, yeah, Tom Atkins. Mm -hmm. uh, he has a legacy in cheesy horror film from the seven from the eighties. We got uh -huh. Creep Show, yeah. uh, Night of the Creeps. Uh, yes. What else was he was in Halloween actually as well. Yeah, yeah, the the uh, part three. I want to say. Yeah, yeah. So Tom Atkins rocks. Oh, he's Order he a badass. So where Tom Atkins comes into this film, he's he owns uh, a fishing boat uh, in Antonio Bay, and he's driving through town, and he picks up a hitchhiker, which is Jamie Lee Curtis, and he's fucking her ten minutes later. Yeah, <laughs> I'm like out of nowhere. Uh, he's like, "Oh, where are you going?" She she goes, "You're not a weirdo, are you?" No, you know, it's like, and then like <laughs> a few scenes later, they're in bed together, and then I love the way that. He, it comes about it. He goes to her, by the way, what's your name? I love that. <laughs> Which I thought love was it. funny. It was totally yeah. out of left field. It really was. <laughs> uh, uh, another yeah. scene that I loved was the, the, the crew of the seagrass when the Elizabeth Dane, which is the sh name of the ship that had all the lepers. Uh huh. When it appears out of the fog in the ocean. Oh, dude, that gave me chills. It was creepier than hell. You got the music. Doom, doom, uh -huh. doom, doom. Yeah. And then they're like, what is it? It's a ship. And they, oh, God. I mean, it was. Crazy. I have to say, that's one of my favorite scenes. Yeah, it is an incredible scene. And, and at that, this movie has tons of great sequences. Mm -hmm. Now, what, do you know what Atkins' name was? Tom Atkins, what character he played? Do you oh, remember? Jesus. Because uh, I saw the remake and I. Uh, uh, Nick? Nick castle oh wait a second nick castle that sounds familiar that is the actor that the name of the actual actor who played the original michael myers in halloween oh no way <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah so a little homage there to the original halloween which by the way a little side note uh nick castle of course who was the original michael myers and he was michael myers in the 2018 version as well mm-hmm uh, also an accomplished director. Oh, okay. Yeah, I don't know if you remember a little film called The Boy Who Could Fly. 
Yes, I remember that. Very sweet coming of age film about an autistic boy who thinks he can fly. Well, well he could. He, and he could fly. Well, that was directed by Nick Castle. No, wait, you know, I have to see that movie again. I totally forgot about that movie. Well, guess what? Mm-hmm. When we do our next episode on films that time forgot, that's one of them. Okay, that, that sounds good. Yes, it's definitely a must. Um, but I won't give, I kind of give away uh, one movie, but it's one more that you're going to really enjoy as well. Okay, all right, cool. All right. But uh, I also like the fact that it was very original uh, mm-hmm. overall. It didn't have a lot of cliches, yet it did. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the one cliche that just had me laughing my ass off is that you got your typical dumbass character, right? Who's kind mm-hmm. of a dumbass. You kind of find him annoying. And he's walking through somewhere. He's in a situation where he hears the creature nearby. And what is his response? Okay, dumbass. This isn't funny. I'm going to kick your ass. <laughs> and that's Dan, the weather guy who communicates with uh, the DJ. Oh, he was cool, though. And he gets fucked up. <laughs> He, he was so he was such a cool character yeah well now to further uh, elaborate for those who you haven't seen it uh adrian barbeau the ever so beautiful brunette actress from several john carpenter films she plays a dj who owns her own radio station and she transmits out of a lighthouse off of antonio bay and uh i forgot her voice what does she sound like Hello, and welcome to Antonio Bay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. And so it's, oh, that was she's good. Freaking, thank you, thank you, thank you. She's freaking awesome. Oh, man. I mean, she was awesome. And uh, so she contacts, you know, she's in regular contact with the weather dude who's always hitting on her with his, with his bullshit one-liners or whatever. And uh, the fog starts to roll in and he opens the door and he's like, okay, dumbass, you know, and this is not funny. And he gets eaten or something. That, he gets eaten. But yeah, and <laughs> the thing is, is that I love the, the relationship because, you know, they kind of keep each other company, you know, every night. They only know each other by voice. Right, right. And uh, which is pretty cool. I mean, uh, and you, you you also get the the sense of a small town community and everybody one way or another they know each other. I mean, it's mm-hmm. um it's great. Yeah, it's awesome. And, you know, she's supposed to also be like the voice to keep them company when they're out on fishing and stuff. I, I thought that was really cool. Yeah, yeah, she's like like the siren uh, of the ocean for the sailors who are fishing. Mm-hmm. Yes, exactly. Okay, now another scene that really had me tense was the scene where the fog is rolling in and all shit is breaking loose and uh our heroine uh played by adrian barbeau oh yes the roof she gets up on the tiny little roof of the of the uh lighthouse and the fog is creeping up on all sides and the, there's hooks coming up on the side off the ladder trying to get her oh actually i thought you were gonna uh talk about the scene prior to that where she's on the radio realizing that the, that the fog is heading to her house where her little boy is at oh and she's crying out for help my son somebody please get to my son oh yes yes oh my god the the yeah and, and that's I the thing actress. oh absolutely and and again you know hats off again to to john carpenter for structuring a scene like that because normally yeah a, a fog can seem spooky but is it menacing and, and terrifying no but he made it terrifying yes oh and like i said you know the urgency with the music so you have the urgency in 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 adrian's voice you know please help somebody please help my son you know she's desperate and the music pounding in the background oh my god and then the kid you know sitting there you know and these fuckers are trying to get through the door oh oh man yeah i mean again it's the heart pounding score and the work with the camera and it's like everything's going fast while the fog is moving in slow it's this this contradiction of of pacing that it, it it's really intense which is not many directors can pull that off yeah exactly and you know and it wasn't like the, the you know your typical kind of scary movie where you know the the evil slasher guy he's coming to get you um no something that you can't see you know it's very unique the faceless shape the mm-hmm. monster that you can't see which is something that uh he implemented in the original halloween film that he did you see the monster 
But what do you know about him? You don't know shit about him. And that's what makes him faceless. And he, he didn't need all that blood and gore no. to, to freak you out. Right, right. Now, going back to Adrian Barbeau, there's a, um, a show on Shudder called Creep Show, which is a, a TV version of the movie. Mm-hmm. And it's anthology series. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's awesome series. Yeah. And Adrian Barbo got bless her. So she shows up in the first episode. What was the first? Because I did see it. I, I totally forgot what the first episode was. Yeah. Some something coming into town and taking over or something. And, you know, she's already aged and everything, but you can still see her grace. And just seeing her there, you're like, yeah, you, this is where you belong. And it's it was so mm-hmm. great to see. Now, you know, Carpenter and uh, Barbo were married oh no way yeah at the time of making this film trip out yeah and when he wrote the film when he wrote the script he wrote it specifically for her oh he did a wonderful job oh amazing now what's kind of sad is that okay on the flip side when he was doing halloween Mm -hmm. he was married at the time to deborah hill who was the producer of halloween Mm -hmm. and uh he had an affair around that time and that's where they ended up having a divorce during halloween oh wow that's sad yeah but the consummate professional that deborah hill was she continued to work on the film and uh just trudged forward and she you know she maintained a professional relationship with john carpenter up until her death uh she yeah uh, just an amazing producer director writer just just an all-around loss uh in in the cinematic world wow all right so what do you say we get into the uh, numbers of this film okay yeah let's hear it the film cost uh at the time of production about a million bucks that's Uh, crazy (laughs) yeah exactly just the production itself i mean it cost three million overall to get it out into theaters but um so you're looking in today's dollars about four to eight million dollars in today's uh, money shit yeah that's nothing that's nothing box office at the time was about 21 million which is about 80 million dollars in today's adjusted inflation wow yeah so the movie basically made about 21 times over its uh, initial budget they killed it <laughs> no yeah, did they, it. no it killed it wow <laughs> <laughs> but it was a unique film again i mean at the time we had a lot of you know that was the beginning of the slasher films the freddy krueger's the uh, jason's and so forth which were great this was a different approach this was not a slasher movie this was a good old-fashioned ghost story it was it, uh, it was awesome yeah so now reviews and scores uh kevin thomas of the la times uh he basically praised it calling it an elegant and scary thriller roger ebert however gave it two out of four stars ah boo yeah sorry roger we don't agree we don't uh, no i am to be uh, the film is currently sitting at a 6.8, Metacritic 55, Rotten Tomatoes 75% with an audience score of 65, and Letterboxd 3.5 out of 5. Wow. Not bad numbers. I would give it higher numbers, but that's just me being oh. nostalgically biased. But it was a great film. Uh, yeah, definitely entertaining. So uh, let's get the our reviews and scores on this. You go first. Okay. So yeah, um, he set the mood, you know, uh, right off the bat, you know, you feel like you're on a fishing barge with a bunch of crusty old sailors. Yeah, definitely. They set the mood. You, you, you felt anxious. You felt an urgency just to get the hell away from that fog. It, it was awesome. Very unique. Mm-hmm. Great storytelling. I love the hell out of the, uh, that cast. Um, I am going to give it uh, 8.5 fish hooks. Oh, not bad. All right. Well, to me, I loved it because I love a good old fashioned ghost tale. It, and it's exactly what it is. It's it's heart thumping uh, with suspense, genuine scares. I mean, you have your jump scares here and there, but the rest is all about suspense and just being creeped out and, and the building tension. John Carpenter, he is a master orchestrator of suspense. Uh, I'm going to have to give this an eight out of 10 hooks. Nice, nice. Yeah, yeah definitely. It's. Again, we can't urge you guys enough uh, to to watch this if you have not seen this. Yeah. It, it's a classic, definitely. You know, yeah, it, it, it's it's. I can't put into words how much of a great movie this is. Yeah, and it, and and I think it still holds uh, the test of time. In fact, they recently, well, I don't know how recent, but they released the 4K restored version of this film. 
Ooh, okay. And very, very deserving of, of that, which I'm going to have to pick up somewhere. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. All right. So let's move on to the next film. All right. Okay. The Fog Knows What You Did Last Summer. mist full of vengeful spirits haunts a prosperous island off the coast of Oregon and its inhabitants they begin to learn their own dark secrets that lie deep within their town the film we're talking about is The Fog from 2005 and is directed by Rupert Wainwright the film stars Tom Welling Maggie Grace and Selma Blair okay now <sighs> Okay, uh, get the spatula out because we're flipping this right over from where we were before. Mm, 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 okay, so where do we begin? Uh, so first of all, we got Tom Welling, who was uh, Smallville's uh, Superman, right? Right, right. Maggie Grace, who, when I started watching this remake, I saw the name uh, in the credits, and I'm like, Maggie Grace, why does that sound familiar? Why is such an impact? I, were, I don't like her. Uh, yeah, is she the blonde? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I hated her character yeah. in what I had seen her in, which was Lost. There we go. That's why I don't like her. Yeah, I, I hated her. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, Maggie, if you're listening to this. Great actress. Hey, you know what? You sold it. Yeah. Yeah. And, we uh, legit did not like you. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, but yeah. So, okay, here we go. This movie was an empty version a stripped down version a watered of, down version no no pun intended um <laughs> hey but you, uh, but yeah it definitely uh had the feeling of like films like i know what you did last summer and stuff like that uh, which does not work for me in this n- case no no well we're not trying to get what well, they try to make a horror film they but failed. They failed. The fog technically is listed as horror, but more specifically, it's a suspense ghost thriller. And yeah. that's what this piece of shit was not. Uh, it was void. It was empty. It was just, you know, they, they try to convolute the plot and, and, and it was just a jumbled mess. I mean, you know, if you're going to redo a movie, you got to look at what made it successful in the first place. And, you know, what can we do to, you know, follow that and make it our own? Right, right. I mean, you, you try, you know, a film is like a stew or, or, or a recipe of where you have specific ingredients that make it unique to what it is. Mm-hmm. You follow that recipe and then you're like, hmm, you know what? Let's put in some paprika. Let, let's, let's put in, you know, some oregano, you know? Yeah, and in this one, they, t- they dumped in some dog shit. <laughs> basically oh man it was it's hard like, for me to look at it was it was and you know i had to force myself to finish it but uh uh yeah it, it was just a mess uh they you know again they they rename they named the characters the same they kept that the same the name of the town antonio bay and so forth but uh, and certain uh, things they did follow through with you know like uh the scene where you know uh, that that wooden plank catches on fire at the radio station—they did right. follow that, but it just—it wasn't the same feel. It just—it yeah. fell short. Yeah, I mean, and I think the mistake with a lot of remakes is that they say, "Well, this this is our version. This is a different uh, version." Exactly. Like, okay, what was the name of that 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 boat, that fishing boat that that everybody got killed on? Oh, the seagrass. The seagrass. So in the original, we have, you know, a bunch of crusty ass sailors getting drunk. And, you know, and they, they come across the pirate ship. And I mean, you, 
you know, you get that feel, you know, you have the music bumping. This one, you got a bunch of, you know, two, you know, horny guys with two slutty ass chicks. And you're like, I hope they fucking die. <laughs> no sympathy there. Y'all being stupid. Uh, and yeah. on top of that, then they get, they get hacked off by invisible things. That pissed me off. Where in the original, you at least see like the, the, the hooked hand of one of the you know pirate dudes you know mm-hmm. killing them you you don't see anything you mm. see mm. And, and what was really impactful uh of the first of the the original version was that the, there's the romanticism of the sailor the fisherman the lonely fisherman and they're out at sea and they're just trying to you know make a living and yeah. so and that's part of the 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 whole um, you know the whole yeah, you can almost feel. hear yeah you can almost hear like a sea shanty being sang by by a sailor or something you know right and in this you got like you said two horny dudes trying to get uh you know trying to hook up with a couple of slutty broads and it's uh, you like fucking die there's no sympathy there from they don't epitomize uh what the sailor is what the fisherman is and mm-hmm. the, the sea life and like is it the sea shanty and all that stuff it's just yeah th- th- it's like they're on lake havasu you know trying to get drunk and laid exactly it was stupid it oh god yeah now what's fucked up is that the main guy who is like the co-captain uh because the captain is nick castle which is played by uh tom, tom welling mm-hmm. so he you know the, his assistant takes the boat out and to do this stupidity so they kill the entire crew except him, which kills the 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 feel which that was you know in the original. There's nothing so haunting in sea lore as coming up to a a ghost ship. Mm-hmm, exactly. And there's nobody there. They're missing, or they find the bodies. They find one body, whatever. But there's a mystery to it. That there was but, no buildup either. Like yeah. they don't have all the weird shit, you know, happening. Right. It just like happens. And, and how fucked up is this? The the his his co captain, uh, you know, the black. He's a black dude, right? Mm-hmm. All these white folk get killed. Cops come down. Yo, man, you're a suspect. That's fucked up. He was in a freaking. Uh, he was in a freezer. Yeah, he hid in a freezer to survive. <laughs> and these white cops come over to him and say, "Uh, we need to speak to you. You're our leading suspect. Why?" Cause he's black they have no proof on that shit either it's oh god it was that was just so annoying and how stupid was this so-called police investigation what a joke i oh, mean god. there's a fucking video camera on that, that, that boat and these uh, yeah and how easy was it for them to swipe it yeah you know all they had to do is the video camera showed what happened but no what happens these bumbling dumbass mayberry cops don't even find the camera then our wonderful uh, uh, Maggie Grace as Elizabeth <laughs> finds the fucking camera, <laughs> looks at the video and goes, oh, my God. Now, you think she'd go to the cops, right? No, no. She she had, uh, she she starts walking up, falls into the fucking water, gets attacked by seaweed and loses the camera. Yeah, I think it was a plot just to bring the black man down. That was bullshit. That was messed up. That was, but uh, you usually, you know, I hate to say it, but uh, you know, a lot of times uh, the first one to die is the, you know, the black guy, yeah. but no, they just went total jacked up and made him the suspect. <laughs> yeah. And that was really, and there was no probable cause. Was, I mean, granted, everybody's a suspect, right. In, in invest, police investigation, mm-hmm. but yeah, no, that now back to Elizabeth, <laughs> Maggie Grace. Now what a dumbass. I mean, first of all, again, let's go back. She gets the camera. Oh, what is this? Oh, my God. It's police evidence. What do I do? I'm going to study it. I'm going to investigate. And she falls in water, loses the camera, right? And gets attacked by seaweed. Yeah, seaweed. Ooh, <laughs> dangerous stuff, right? Then there's another scene which which I found hilarious. If you catch it, you'll laugh. If you don't, you kind of uh, glaze over it, okay? Uh-huh, right. When she, when she goes to the church... And she goes looking for Father Malone, right? At right. night. Oh, yes. I think I know what you're talking okay. about. She walks up to the, uh, like, I guess the rectory or whatever. And there's a door that's closed, right? And she starts pounding at the door. There's, Father a, fucking Malone. Lock. there's a fucking lock right there. Right. Now you go, okay, you pound it and you go, oh, there's a padlock outside. Oh, what does she do? 
She continues pounding on the door. What the fuck is he going to do? He's going to slither his hand out of the crack and open up the padlock from the inside? I think that's what I realized. I'm like, okay, I'm fucking done with this shit. <laughs> this is so stupid. <laughs> I thought that shit was hilarious. I mean, again, knock, knock, knock. No answer. Oh, there's a padlock on my side. <laughs> There's nobody going to answer the door, but she continues knocking in. I'm like, really, bitch? You, you really think he's going to come out that door? <laughs> um, oh, God. Oh, gosh. Yeah, that that was that was funny. And again, it's a scene that, you know, a little detail that if you miss it, you miss it. But if you catch it, it will make you chuckle. <laughs> it's so stupid. Yeah, no, I caught that one. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, that that was hilarious. I, I, mean, think, I think my, that's where my brain checked out. I'm like, yeah, no, I can't do see, this to you. <laughs> Yeah, that's the blonde shit that gives poor blonde women a bad name. Okay? Seriously. Oh, my God. But it, it, that was funny. Now, here's another aspect that I think where this movie failed. They give way too much backstory on the the ghost, uh, the, the leper colony people. Uh, you know what? It got boring. It did. They, can, they just went on and on and on about it. You got the flashbacks. And and you literally are able to put a face to the quote unquote monster. And see, and that's that that was the beauty of the original. We did not know what the hell was out there to get us. We had we we knew somewhat of what it was, but yeah, uh, that, that yeah, bored me. It did, and it eliminates the mystery of what lurks in the fog. It's the faceless evil. Yeah, what I liked about the original is that from the very beginning, it gets your heart pounding. You feel the anxiety, and that's throughout the whole film. There is no pause to take a breath. This mm -hmm. one, it pauses long enough for you to be like, ah, okay, we're safe now. Yeah, no, and some of those pauses in this, in this remake are long enough to make you yawn. Yeah, yeah, for real. And here's another thing that really I found. Now, I, I understand when you do a remake, you change certain things, right? Okay, mm -hmm. if it was on a train in the original, it's on a boat in the remake. Mm -hmm. It's no big deal. It's just a small detail. That's right. in, it's not consequential to the plot. Here, the climax of the film mm -hmm. uh, in the remake takes place at the town hall. Right. In the original, it takes place at the church when the fog is coming in. All the characters pretty much converge onto this church and the fog is rolling in and trying to break in and so forth. Mm -hmm. By changing the location of changing it from the church to a town hall or like a city hall, that really, it kills it right there. Because to me, what that represented was the culmination of the, 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 the battle or, or the presence of holiness and unholiness good and evil of both coming to pass right and you know that sinful or those who are cursed having to pay for their sins and so forth i mean there's just so much you can go with with how the original was structured mm -hmm. and finally okay what the fuck was up with that ending with uh, elizabeth and that whole shining thing <laughs> the so shiny thing. oh god so as it turns out <sighs> The name of the ship is the Elizabeth Dane. Oh, come on. And in this version, her, the chick's name is Elizabeth. Okay. Now, I found that kind of weird. I'm not sure if uh, Jamie Lee Curtis or anybody was named Elizabeth in the original. I want to say it was. I think so. But that was it. It was just Elizabeth. Okay. Boom. Right. And, exactly. And for some great reason, by mastery of jo John Carpenter's direction, you're able to separate the two and not make any connection, right? Right. But here, Elizabeth was the the, the long deceased wife of the main ghost dude who she died and she went to the bottom of the ocean. And Elizabeth, the dumb blonde in this movie, <laughs> is the fucking reincarnation of his long lost love. And at the end, in this climax, he, he brings her close to him and he, you know, this creature with this weird looking thing and he, and he kisses her and he becomes normal and they take off together. And then at the end, you see like an old faded black and white picture. <laughs> I'm sorry. The shining people, the shining, you're not. Okay. That was not necessary. Oh man. It's at that point that I had this movie if there was still 20 minutes left to this movie, I would have just turned it off. <sighs> Seriously. Yeah. I mean, I guess uh, if anything, this, if this is filmmaking one-on-one as to how not to make a remake. 
Yeah, exactly. They they had no respect for the original. No. And you know, and you got, you know, the master himself, John Carpenter. Uh he is credited as a uh producer and he basically he described his involvement in this as I come in, get my check, say hello to everybody, and I go home. Oh god. Well, he, you know, it's, I kind of feel like he abandoned <laughs> he abandoned ship. He jumped ship. Yeah. Oh, 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 good one. I like that. <laughs> I'm full of them today. <laughs> you're, you're full of something. Oh, seriously. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's a trip because uh, they approached him to be more involved in this film. And he didn't want to. But he realized that this movie is going to get done with or without him. And with him, at least he gets a check. And he can just walk away and let them fuck up his original film. And that's he, what he did. You know, he probably felt, you know, why are they remaking such an awesome movie? Yeah. You know, I mean, and oh my God, you know what? And I don't know about you, but I had a problem with the character that was Adrian Barbro's character. Yeah. I hated that chick that they got for, uh, to, to play her. Oh, what's her name? Um, Selma Blair. Selma Blair. Okay. I- I'm not talking smack about her acting abilities or anything mm-hmm. like that. I just feel that she was severely miscast. Yeah. I mean, she was great. She was in um, Hellboy. Yeah. You know, great actress. You know, yeah. I'm not talking shit about her, her abilities. I'm just talking shit about, you know, the casting choice. Okay. We have Adrian Barbo, who is a classy, sexy, sultry woman. Right. Who happens to be a single mom, you know, very passionate, very, you know, very capable woman, strong female. Then we see that this young lady. And I, I look at her, I'm like, did they change the storyline? Is, uh, is it the big sister who is taking care of the little boy? I get where you're going. And she, she doesn't come across as a single mom. At all. I mean, you, you hear the kind of music that, that she's playing. You know, when we first see her, I think what she's uh, doing, giving herself a pedicure. Mm. I mean, she gives off high school, college girl vibes. Yeah, she does. She does. And um, because... Like you said, uh, Adrian Barbo, sultry, sexy, very womanly, but she does portray the motherly instinct, the uh, the motherly uh, uh, vibe. Exactly, you feel it, you know, especially you know when she's frantically calling out for help for her little boy, mm-hmm. you yeah. know. And this yeah. girl did, does nothing for. I mean, like I said, I, I I'm looking at. I'm like, she looks like the kid's big sister. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, they could have gotten somebody a little bit more you know, seasoned, a little bit more mature, you know, to play that, you know, yeah, part. Yeah, it just did not work, did not work. Well, I mean, the film did really bad. I mean, Rupert uh, Wainwright, uh, this was his last director's job. Oh, really? Uh, yeah, because Good. Uh, it, was, it was a critical and financial failure, and uh, that led to his film career uh, taking a dive. <laughs> uh, there's another one. <laughs> And uh, now let's, I want, I want to mention once again, uh, the late great Deborah Hill, and she was a producer with John Carpenter and films, everything from Halloween one, two, and three, the fog escape from New York, the dead zone adventures in babysitting. Oh, that was a cool movie. Escape from LA and world trade center. Wow. Ooh, another good movie. Yeah. And so she was an accomplished, solid uh, producer and uh, unfortunately, she passed away about a week before uh, filming on this film began. Did she? I had no idea. Yeah, yeah. So now, budget at the time of this film was about $18 million. $18 million. Yeah, which is about $29 million in today's money. Okay. Now, get this. Box office was $46 million, which is about $73 million today. So about $46 so it uh, it barely doubled what it made what it was would cost. Now you factor in marketing, uh, promotional elements, uh, commercials, and all that stuff. It lost money. It oh lost wow! Money. Yeah. Uh, so so you can see how it uh, it really killed the director's um, career, unfortunately. But the Hollywood Reporter um, he said that this remake it lacked the scares necessary to satisfy its target audience. I agree. I agree. Yeah. I mean, this is a ghost story. You want to be thrilled. You want to be spooked. And they had none of that. No, uh, absolutely. Yeah. Cinema score audience surveyed gave it a C minus. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's pretty low. IMDb, 3.7. Wow. Uh, Metacritic, 27. Rotten Tomatoes, critic score, 4%. Whoa. Yeah. <laughs> oh, crap. I think they were trying to say something there that uh, they didn't care much for this movie. Uh, audience <laughs> score was 19% and letterbox is at a 1.8 stars out of five. Damn. Yeah. So uh, let's go into our ratings and scores on this. Uh, I'll go first. Okay. Um, I'll get this off my chest. <laughs> <sighs> well, the, you know, I, I good for them. They give it a shot, right? I mean, filmmaking is what it is. It's, um, hit or miss exactly and, uh, but this one was unimpressively bland and void of any real scares uh it was a total misstep in how to remake a film so on the film joel scale i'm gonna give this two out of ten fish hooks wow yeah and, Damn. yeah it's, it's almost an insult to the original it, it is it really is um yeah, you know, like like I said, you know, if you're gonna if you're gonna you know do, I can't stress that enough. If you're gonna remake it, do it right. Um, it, it was a slap in the face to the original. Um, I hated the cast. They could have done a whole lot better. It just it felt really half-assed. Uh, they added shit that shouldn't have been uh, didn't need to be added. It felt nothing like a pirate's tale. Yeah, I. So I'm gonna give it. <sighs> what did you give it? I gave it a two. <laughs> give it a two. I'm going to give it a 3.5 for trying. Okay. You're very, very generous. I'm very generous. I'm very generous. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe be, I, you know what? That 1.5 uh, uh, hook that you gave it extra was because it had the same title probably, right? Because the title. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I like All the right. title. Um, yeah. Uh, it's definitely a forgettable remake. So we mentioned John Carpenter quite a bit in this in this in this episode. So we're going to recommend three top-notch John Carpenter films. Okay. So the first one uh, is Escape from New York with Kurt Russell. I've never seen that. You've never seen it? Well, you got to watch it now. Otherwise, I'm gonna have to kick you off the pod. Okay, I was. I'll watch it. I'll watch it. <laughs> I. No, I it I saw the uh, the sequel. I think I went with you to go see the sequel. Yeah, yeah, I went to go see it in uh, in Westwood, and it was uh -huh. it was not that great. Nah, uh, it was I. Right. But Escape from New York is wow. It's it, it's uh, it's an action suspense thriller where it's a dystopian future where uh, the island of well, uh, Manhattan is completely walled off, and it's a prison, and the president some is flying over plane gets into trouble. He launches in a special pod and he lands right in the middle of Manhattan. So they hire Snake Plitzkin, who is ex-military, ex-commando, ex-badass, and now number one wanted on the FBI government's list, right? Mm -hmm. So they arrest him and they say, okay, we'll give you freedom, but you got to go in there and rescue the president. And he has to go in there with all these horrible, dangerous criminals that are lurking in the city and rescue. So it's, it's a really freaking awesome film. Uh, Kurt Russell, it's, he's awesome, oh, and, it's, and it's Kurt Russell. You can't lose. Mm -hmm. uh, and what's great about it is, is it is a suspense action thriller, but it has elements of horror, which is pretty interesting. Uh, so you definitely got to check it out. Okay, all right, uh, I will check it out. All right, and the next one is another film. I think it was before Halloween, I believe. Mm. Movie called Assault on Precinct Thirteen. Yes, 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 yes. Good movie great film which they also did a remake and, and screwed the pooch on that one as well <laughs> screwed the pooch <laughs> poor dog uh but, but it, it was pretty bad but the original again it's a it's a suspense thriller that has nothing to do with horror but it has elements of horror in it and it's just an amazing suspenseful film super low budget Great film. It, it was it was a good film, very good film. Yeah, and the final one we're going to uh, recommend is another Kurt Russell favorite of mine, okay. directed by Carpenter as well. Big Trouble in Little China. <laughs> oh yes! Oh my God, I love that freaking movie. I mean, that one when I first saw it, I'm when I, I was a big John Carpenter fan already, and when I saw it, I'm like, what the hell is this? This is not John Carpenter, but it's fantastic. It's has elements of fantasy, adventure, action, comedy, a swashbuckling. And it's like, it has things where he's basically a truck driver 
who stops by uh, Little China every now and then to eat or whatever, hang out with his friend. And he gets sucked into this underworld of magic, literally under un, underworld of <laughs> wizards and magic. And, and oh, it's fantastic. Who's uh, that, that um, pretty blonde chick? She was in um, Mannequin. Is it Kim Cattrall? Uh, yeah, yeah. Kim Cattrall's in it as well. Yes. Oh, my God. I love that movie. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. It's not what you'd expect from a John Carpenter film, and it's just a blast and yeah. just a, a perennial favorite for me. Yeah, definitely agree. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, it was fantastic. So, what do you say we start winding this down? Okay, let's let's go. Let's do. This. Let's go. All righty. So, don't forget to tune in next week. We are going to do the best of and the worst of. So. Tune in and find out what we got uh, in store for you. So definitely check that out. Uh, we really hope you enjoyed the show. Please help to support the pod by giving us a nice five-star rating. Leave us a good review. Another way you can uh, support us is simply just to follow us and or subscribe to us on Amazon, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Deezer, Audible, Boomplay, or wherever you get your podcast fix. Also, don't forget to drop by our Facebook group, uh, join our Facebook group, leave us a comment, let us know how we're doing. We're also on Instagram, TikTok, and we have a YouTube channel where we have all our current uh, episodes on as well. So definitely check that out. Uh, you can email us directly if you'd like to the filmjoepod at gmail.com. All these links, they're in the notes below. So please check them out. Uh, so Daisy. Yes. I'm going to give you the final word of the day. All right. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be a bit redundant, but for the love of God, stop making shitty remakes. Respect the movie. Respect the original. Yeah, I agree. I, I, you know, I can't put it any more, uh, <laughs> any more perfect than that. Respect. <laughs> and I think that's what it's about. Yep. Yep. Respect right. it, man. Especially with films like that that are so loved or just so damn near perfect. Exactly. All righty. So with that being said, I'm Joe. I'm Daisy. And this is the Film Joe Podcast, where film talk happens.